important topic for all of us. Uh, it's a topic that is of so much important importance and concern to all of us. The uh, social and economic impact of uh, production of illegal uh, production of uh, production of uh, illicit drugs in Colombia. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the uh, Caja Gay for allowing us to use this wonderful facility today. Uh, also, um, I would like to thank uh, the uh, Mexican group of Gutingan for, uh, you know, for their support, for allowing us to uh, coordinate this event, especially my colleague uh, Luis Garcia for all his efforts to help us prepare this presentation. Um, and also I want to thank my colleagues, uh, my friends, uh, Sonia Trivino, uh, Cesar Jimenez, uh, Joanna Ramirez, and John Zuluaga, who uh, prepared these different topics for all of us today, and I know they put a lot of hours into this presentation, so I want to thank you for all their, their hard work. I also want to thank our professor, uh, Marcelo Ibanez Diaz, for um, you know, accepting our invitation to uh, be here today. Uh, she was very helpful in giving us feedback throughout the preparation of our uh, different presentations, so I want to thank her for, for her support. Um, the reason, basically, we, we decided to do this session was because um, after all the lost lives of political leaders in Colombia, uh, judges, uh, journalists, uh, thousands of innocent civilians to the uh, uh, irreversible damage that has been caused to the uh, country democratic institutions. There hasn't been any other country in the world that has paid a higher price to the war on drugs than Colombia. So basically this session just tries to you know, show you, gives you some sort, of, uh, uh, some sort of insight into what has been the social and economic experience as one of the largest uh, producers of drugs in the world. Good evening, everyone. Um, so to start this very brief introduction, I would like to borrow a quote from a report that the Financial Times ran on, on us last year. Uh, For decades, the rock Andean landscape harbored crime and violence, but today regional pride is emerging in a revived economy. So Colombia is a country of roughly 47 million people. We are the third most populous um, country in South America, the second largest Spanish-speaking country in the, in the world. Over the last few years, uh, we have undergone a very favorable economic and political transformation, which has rendered the country as a main um, a destination for foreign investment. We have grown at a steady rate that has surpassed um, the, world, uh, the world's average. Um, we are expected to continue growing at one of the five, uh, at one of the fastest rates for the next um, 25 years. Uh, we have also experienced a very stable inflation rate. Um, our main exports are oil and coal. Last year, we broke an all-time record for foreign direct investment, <coughs> but we also need to tackle some problems, such as we have one of the highest unemployment and inequality rates in South America which you can see in our Gini coefficient. Uh, of course, our president is Mr. Juan, Juan Manuel Santos, who was elected in office in August 2010. So Colombia's sound economic performance it has been rewarded with an investment grade but by all the main credit agents. Um, in just in 2012, we were the second most profitable like stock exchange only surprised by the DAX in Germany. We are one of the fastest growing markets in the region. Last year, Medellin was chosen as the most innovative city in 2013 um, among 200 cities. So you, you guys can um, so you can see how the country has, has experienced an economic boom over the last few years and how infrastructure um, has improved. So here's a very brief overview of um, what we will cover tonight. So of course, Colombia has suffered one of the longest internal conflicts in the Western and Hemisphere. Um, we have been working in close cooperation with the government of the United States um, to eradicate and tackle uh, production and drug trafficking. Um, as of last year, we're the second largest producer of cocaine uh, we started formal peace talks with the FARC in October 2012. But um, I don't want to get into those to topics because um, John will carry out an in-depth analysis. 
So what are the main challenges that lie ahead for Colombia? So of course, we have a very high inequality and poverty rate, so the first thing that we need to do is to think of opportunities uh, for new generations so they can find new jobs outside um, crime and gangs. Uh, we need to keep working on improving our, um, and improving our security rates uh, to guarantee that human rights are enforced within the country, of course. It is uh, also a very important place in the future of Colombia because it could be the, the final way to put an end to a very long um, conflict that has spanned for over five decades. We also need to deal with the consequences of the environmental degradation that we have suffered from um, irrigation, from spray, um, aerial spraying, <coughs> and the public health consequences. So, good evening. Ich freue mich heute mit Ihnen zu sein, zum ersten Mal in diesem Vortragsabend über kolumbianische Probleme zu diskutieren. Der Vorschlag von den Mexikanern hat mich sehr motiviert. Vielen Dank für die Einladung. Diese Gelegenheit ermöglicht eine interessante Vorstellung eines alten Problems in Kolumbien, Gewalt und Drogenhandel. Und wohl wir nur einen, einen Überblick bzw. nicht im Detail diese Problematik an der Stelle werden. Soll die Diskussion an neue Blickpunkte der kolumbianischen Lage heranbringen. Deshalb möchte ich wieder Mexikaner in Göttingen und der KHG für die Einladung danken. Diese Initiativen beitragen zur Entwicklung von Verständnis alter lateinamerikanischer Probleme. Ich hoffe, es sei nicht das letzte Mal, sondern dass wir äh, weiter diskutieren können hier in diesem Vortragsabend über Lateinamerika. Ich werde mich in den nächsten 15 Minuten mit dem laufenden Demobilisierungsprozess in Kolumbien beschäftigen, um die Gründe und Auswirkungen dieses Prozesses zu verstehen. Es ist wichtig vorzumerken, dass der kolumbianische Bürgerkrieg ein sehr langes, langer bewaffneter Konflikt ist. An diesem Konflikt sind drei gewaltsame Akteure, Akteure beteiligt. Die Stadt, Paramilitärs und Guerilla, oder Guerillas, muss man sagen, die Drogenmafia ist keine eigenständige Konfliktspartei in Kolumbien, in diesem Konflikt, sondern mit einer oder mehreren Parteien, Konfliktsparteien verbunden. Diese kämpfen mit und gegeneinander und von den innenpolitischen Konflikten Kolumbiens sind auch die Nachbarländer äh, stark betroffen. Nachbarländer, das heißt Ecuador, Brasil, Venezuela, Brasilien, Ecuador, Venezuela, Panama. Äh, Guerilla und Paramilitärs respektieren oftmals nicht die Landesgrenzen und kolumbianische Drogenhandler exportieren einen großen Teil ihrer Lieferungen für die USA und Europa über die Nachbarländer. Das geht auch über Mexiko nach USA oder äh, Venezuela, Afrika inklusive nach Europa. Die Wirkungen von kolumbianischen Konflikt kann man durch den folgenden Statistiken beobachten. So viele Menschenrechtsverletzungen wurden in den letzten 20 Jahren in Kolumbien begangen. Es gibt Angriffe auf zivile Objekte, Antipersonenmine, Entführungen, Gefallen in kriegerischen Auseinandersetzungen, Vertreibungen, gesielte Totungen, Rekrutierungen, Massaker, sexuelle Gewalt, Terroranschläge, etc., etc. Besonders beeindruckend sind die Nummer von Vertreibungen und gesielte Tötungen. Insgesamt oh, ungefähr sind schon 6 Millionen Opfer in Kolumbien. In Zahlen könnte es mit dem Zweiten Weltkrieg verglichen werden. Die Akteure, des, also Akteure der Gewalt, könnten als gewaltsam, mittelgewaltsam und nicht gewaltsam eingestuft werden. Das ist wichtig zu unterscheiden. In Kolumbien eine Sache sind Gewaltparteien und andere Sache sind Konfliktparteien. Werde ich äh, kurz erklären. Als gewaltsam werden Paramilitärs, Guerillas, Kombos oder Bakrin und Staat bezeichnet. Diese sind Gewaltparteien, 
Aber nicht alle sind Konfliktparteien. Konfliktparteien im Sinne von humanitären Völkerrecht sind Guerillas, ehemalige Paramilitärs, heute bei Krim, Banden, kriminelle Organisationen und Staat. Das sind Konfliktparteien. Gut, als nicht gewaltsam werden einen Teil von lokalen Eliten, aber auch sind Gewaltparteien. Also Gewaltparteien sind, dass sie manchmal zusammen mit Narcos, Paramilitärs verbunden werden. Äh, soziale Bewegungen auch und Teile von Guerillas in der Stadt, sogenannte Milizias. Äh, in der Mittelzone bewegen sich alle Beteiligten, außer die Bakrin oder Kombus, Bandas, die immer gewaltsam sind. Gut, das ist schon wie, wie eine Mappe von Gewaltakteure, Konfliktparteien in Kolumbien. Anders gesehen, die beteiligten Parteien können auch als linke Akteure und rechte Akteure bezeichnet werden. Die Linken sind politisch und sozial motiviert, orientiert, beziehungsweise haben als Ursprung ihrer Gewalt politische und soziale Gründe, wie Ungleichheit, Repression gegen die Bevölkerung und so weiter. Also hier kennt es, kennt es also als Ursprung ihrer Gewalt, kennt es Guerilla und äh, ehemalige Autodefensa sein. Die anderen Akteure sind als rechte Gewalt bezeichnet. Es bedeutet, dass diese keinen Streit gegen äh, den Staat haben. Das heißt, es wirtschaftlich orientiert beziehungsweise sind Verteidiger des Privateigentums. Es ist zu bemerken, dass diese Akteure auf verschiedene Weise sich miteinander mischen. Insbesondere gibt es eine wichtige Zusammenarbeit von allen Gruppen, um Drogenhändler zu schützen, bzw. zu unterstützen. Das ist der Fall zum Beispiel mit Guerillas, Kombos, lokale Eliten und insbesondere hemmelige Paramilitärs, heute bei Krim. Die ganze Star mit Narcos, Drogenhändler, verbunden sind und zusammenarbeiten. Äh, und die Folgen von Gewalt und Menschenrechtsverletzungen aufzuarbeiten, wurde in Kolumbien ein Übergangsjustizmodell, äh, Transitional Justice Process, Prozesso de Justicia Transitional. Äh, erste Ziel des Prozesses ist die Wiedereingliederung. Die Wiedereingliederung in das zivile Leben von Mitgliedern der bewaffneten Gruppen zu erleichtern. Dazu wurde ein Demobilisierungsprozess äh, gedacht, die von Gesetz 975 von 2005 normiert ist und mit dem die Entwaffnung, Demobilisierung und Wiedereingliederung solcher Gruppen umfasst werden. Was ist Demobilisierung? Unter Demobilisierung ist der individuelle oder kollektive Acht der Abgabe der Waffen und des Verfahrens der bewaffneten Gruppen zu verstehen. Dieses Verfahren hat äh, die Verfahren von Demobilisierung, Entwaffnung und Wiedereingliederung hat fünf wichtige Phasen. Äh, sorry, hier. Zunächst die Vereinbarung zwischen Gruppen, bewaffneten Gruppen und Stadt. Das war der dem Fall von Paramilitärs in 2002 und heute versuchen es zu machen mit den Guerillas. Das ist die Vereinbarung zwischen Gruppen und Regierung. Dann gibt es eine Sammlung von Kombatanten, die Anmeldung, Entwaffnung und Entlassung von Kombatanten. Die, die erste fünf Phasen der Demobilisierungs, des Demobilisierungsprozesses. Ziel dieses Prozesses ist diese Kombatanten, dem Straßverfahren vom Gesetz 975 äh, zu nominieren. Das werden wir gleich sehen. Nach der Demobilisierung beginnt für einige Kombatanten, nicht für alle Kombatanten, ein Straßverfahren. Die Kombatanten, die schwere Verletzungen gegen Menschenrechte begangen haben, werden von der Regierung dem Straßverfahren durch eine Liste nominiert, sogenannte Postulation. Dieses Verfahren hat fünf Phasen, kurz darstellen hier. Zunächst die Demobilisierung, Entwaffnung und Wiedereingliederung. Nachher die Übersendung der Liste oder Nominierung oder Postulation. Drittens die Ermittlung der Verbrechen. Das macht die Staatsanwaltschaft. 
in Kolumbien. Viertens, nach der Ermittlung gibt es eine Annahme der Vorwürfe. Da müssen die Kombatanten, die Demobilisierten, muss, müssen diese Vorwürfe akzeptieren. Nachher kann man bestimmen, welche Verbrechen begangen haben und äh, eine Strafe geben. Und fünftens, wie gesagt, gibt es ein Urteil und eine alternative Strafe. Alternative Strafe, das heißt, nach dem Verfahren dürfen die nominierten Kombatanten, die äh, in, in Strafverfahren sind, zwischen fünf und acht Jahren im Gefängnis sein und nicht 60 Jahre, wie die maximale Strafe in Kolumbien ist. Das ist ein besonderes Angebot für Kombatanten. Ja? E, natürlich, das Verfahren ist nicht so einfach, wie hier aussieht. Das ist noch komplexer. Es gibt so viele Phasen, so viele Momente, so viele Details, die äh, das Verfahren langsam machen. E, deshalb gibt es momentan, es hat 2006 angefangen, 2005, und bislang gibt es nur, ich glaube, es sind zehn Urteile. Das heißt, zehn Personen, die bestraft werden, von ungefähr 50.000 Kombatanten, die demobilisiert sind. Das, das ist deshalb nicht einfach. Mm, ja. Dieses Angebot war für viele Gruppen und Kombatanten attraktiv. Insgesamt, wie gesagt, sind mehr als 50.000 Kombatanten, Mitglieder von bewaffneten Gruppen, demobilisiert. Die Demobilisierten entsprechen den 74% der Kombatanten in alle Gruppen. Das ist schon eine, eine große Menge. Wie das schon gesagt, sind 27.400 Mitglieder von illegalen Gruppen bis 2014 individuell demobilisiert, das heißt individuell an die Waffen abgegeben und kollektiv bis 2006, das, das war ein Termin für kollektive Demobilisierungen, sind 31.800 Kombatanten entwaffnet. Äh, also insgesamt mehr als 50.000 Kombatanten demobilisiert. Das größte Problem vom Friedensprozess in Kolumbien ist die Unfähigkeit, alle Kombatanten zu ermitteln und zu beurteilen. Laut der Staatsanwaltschaft, kolumbianische äh, Staatsanwaltschaft, sind nur 4.500 Demobilisierten, dem besonderen Strafverfahren nominiert. Das heißt, nur 8% der Demobilisierten werden an den Strafverfahren von Frieden und Justiz beteiligen. Das ist eine große Einschränkung für die Erreichung der Wahrheit des Konflikts und Wiedergutmachung von Opfer. Der rechtliche Rahmen bietet nicht Deutlichkeit zu bestimmen, wie alle Kombatanten ermittelt werden können. Nach dem Gesetz 975, die äh, das besondere Strafverfahren normiert, äh, wurden so viele Richtlinien ausgestellt, die zu einer komplexen Anwendung des Gesetzes äh, geführt haben. Mit anderen Wörtern, wenn alle Kombatanten nicht demobilisiert werden und alle Demobilisierten nicht nominiert werden, dem Strafverfahren, fehlen dem Prozess die Erzählungen vieler Beteilig Beteiligter beziehungsweise fehlt einen großen Teil der Beweismittel. Ohne vollständige Beweismittel wird der Prozess parteilich geführt, insbesondere wenn diese, diese Kombatanten nach USA ausgeliefert werden, wie äh, mit den Paramilitärskommandanten passiert ist, die nach USA ausgeliefert wurden und nicht mehr äh, erzählen haben, nicht weiter äh, erzählen haben, genau. Die Be Beteiligung von Kombatanten ist unerlässlich, um andere Stufe und Tätigkeiten von illegalen Gruppen zu verdeutlichen. Wie hier man äh, sehen kann, es gibt außerdem von Kombatanten mit Rot markiert andere Niveaus, andere Stufen von Gruppen in, in der Organisation. Solche Gruppen, solche Organisationen haben nicht nur Kombatanten, sondern auch wirtschaftliche, politische und soziale Unterstützung, das andere Niveau der Organisation, die auch ermittelt werden muss und die auch äh, bestraft werden müssen. Die Einschränkung der, des Demobilisierungsprozesses und des Strafverfahrens für Kombatanten hat stark die Entwicklung des Konflikts beeinflusst. 
und erfolgreiche Demobilisierung kann Kolumbien noch nicht ein Potskonflikt erreichen. Das heißt, ohne eine richtige, erfolgreiche Demobilisierung kann nicht den Konflikt beenden. Äh, wegen der Nichtbeendigung des Konflikts, der noch durch Drogenhändler finanziert ist, sind andere bewaffnete Gruppen erschienen. Neue, illegale, bewaffnete Gruppen erschienen. Diese Organisationen, oder sogenannten Bakrin, Bandas Criminales, kriminelle Banden, Kombos, sind eine neue Gruppierung von ehemaligen Kombatanten, von denen einige schon vorher demobilisiert wurden. Das ist äh, also ein Recycling von Kombatanten. Ja? In 2013 wurden fünf wichtige große Gruppen identifiziert. Das sind sogenannte Uravenius, die nicht nur in Kolumbien äh, arbeiten, sondern auch in Venezuela, Europa. Letzte Woche wurden 13 äh, Mitglieder von Uravenius in Spanien festgenommen. Unglaublich. Dann sind die Rastrojos, sogenannte Paisas, Aguilas Negras und Erpach. Diese neue Gruppe hat in 2013 ungefähr 5.000 Mitglieder. 5.000 Mitglieder. Und das wird größer. Das wird größer. Weil es noch Drogenhandler gibt. Das heißt, sehr wichtig zu verstehen. Weil das hat eine große Auswirkung, nicht nur in Kolumbien, sondern auch in Lateinamerika, USA und Europa. Diese Auswirkung von Drogenhandler. Nicht nur in Kolumbien, sondern auch in andere, anderen Ländern. Hier kann man kurz, ich glaube, da unten kann man sehen, oder? Ein bisschen. Äh, wo die Vakrin diese neuen Organisationen beeinflussen. Insbesondere gibt es eine starke Präsenz am besten halt von Vakrin in Ost Kolumbien, da mit Blau markiert, und in Bets Kolumbien. Warum genau in diesen Zonen? Diesen Zone? Weil da eine große äh, Kokainproduktion gibt. Ja? Und weil, weil sie durch Drogenhandel finanziert werden, dann deshalb es gibt es einen starken Beeinfluss von Bakrin in diesen Zonen. So zusammengefasst kann man drei wichtige Ideen nennen. Kolumbien verfügt über einen Friedens- und Demobilisierungsprozess mitten im Bürgerkrieg. Also es gibt einen Demobilisierungsprozess ohne Beendigung von Konflikt. Die fehlende Demobilisierung hat zur Folge, dass die paramilitärischen Strukturen, ehemalige paramilitärische Strukturen, nicht zerstört werden können. Teil der Demobilisierten haben sich in neuen kleine legale bewaffnete Gruppen organisiert. Ich glaube, das wurde heute klar dargestellt, dass ohne, ohne, ohne richtige Demobilisierung kann man den Konflikt nicht beenden und ohne Beendigung von Narkotrafik, Kokainproduktion und so weiter, äh, werden immer neue, neue legale bewaffnete Gruppen äh, sein. Das ist die Idee, die heute vorstellen wollte. Vielen Dank für die Aufmerksamkeit und freue mich auf Kommentare. Good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Cesar Jimenez. My background is environmental engineering. And uh, well, my topic tonight is, like, is to uh, give you a, like, a small introduction on what are the impacts uh, that the country suffers, specifically referring to uh, environment and public health. So first of all, uh, um, First of all, some definitions. Uh, environment, we can call it like everything which is life and non alive uh, that surrounds uh, an organism or a population or a community of population. And um, these these conditions uh, make possible uh, the communities or the uh, um, uh, individuals to survive, uh, develop, and uh, uh, and to have to have evolution. Public health uh, could be defined as the conditions uh, that people need uh, to feel healthy uh, by preventing disease, uh, promoting health, and prolonging life uh, among the population. This is a definition from the World, uh, World Health Organization. Uh, what is an environmental impact? Um, it is any change uh, that the environment um, suffers. 
uh, either be adverse or beneficial uh, that results from these human activities. But this is a definition from the US EPA. And the same the definition can be extended in the same way to public health. All this it could be all the consequences uh, that the public health suffer from uh, human activities. So um, from the environmental point of view, we could uh, divide the drug economy into uh, into stages or two processes. That would be the production and then the crop eradication. Um, the production, well, of course, we have the production because there is a there is an economic demand. I'm not uh, well. Economy is not my field of expertise. That this will, uh, Marcela, will talk about this uh, later on. Uh, but definitely, we have we have this problem because there is some demand, and uh, why we have eradication because there is there is some uh, obligation of the Colombian government to eradicate or to fight to continue this war against drugs. Um, production. So uh, this is this is the the coca plant. This is you can see the leaves. Um, <laughs> It is a tropical species. We will. I will. I will refer mainly to to the coca problem in this uh, presentation because it is it is actually the most um, uh, yeah, but the main problem referring to to illicit uh, illicit crops in the country. There's also some um, amapola, uh, but yeah, uh, this is this is the main problem at this time. This uh, plant is classified as illegal. Uh, this is kind of a gray area because. Um, before, uh, well, some native communities uh, have these uh, coca uh, plants, or they, they have these coca crops, and it's part of the culture. But this is only this is allowed only in their territories because it's, it's part of their culture. But uh, when it comes to uh, production of coca crops for uh, for uh, later production of uh, drugs, it is classified as illegal. Um, as it is illegal, it has to be hidden from authorities, and I will I will explain in a minute what what, what are the consequences of trying to uh, hide these uh, crops. Um, well, our country, these these are according to the uh, most recent uh, report from the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime. Mm -hmm. um, these are the the the, the Coca crops that we have uh, in the country by December 2012. So you can see Colombia is a, um, a very biodiverse country. It actually said that it's between the third and fifth place in biodiversity in all the world. Actually, it is also said that it could be the uh, country with the biggest biodiversity in the world if you consider the size of the country. Of course, uh, for example, uh, compared to a country of the size of Brazil. Uh, but uh, we have very, very sensitive ecosystems um, in, in the Pacific area, the Chocó uh, uh, region, uh, in the Amazons uh, area, and also in the limits uh, with Venezuela, in the plains of the, of the um, east of the country. Um, uh, so, uh, well, here you see the distribution of, of the coca crops uh, coincide uh, very much with the sensitive uh, areas of the country, with the most uh, um, biodiversity, biodiversity rich uh, areas of the country. And here in red, you can see um, the distribution of the natural parks, national natural parks, uh, as of uh, 2012, also. And you can see that there's there's there are some uh, there are some areas where you can where, where you can see they coincide. And this is this has been also part of the of the mechanics of the of the of the whole uh, process or the uh, pro uh, the problem. Um, okay. So um, what I was what I was what I wanted to ref to refer before was the um, ecological pressure on our uh, on our territories. So this is this is the actual way of. Uh, how it looks when uh, there are coca crops hidden from the authorities. So the country, the country has some areas which are difficult to access because of the uh, dense vegetation, because of the species uh, of well trees that live there, 
and uh, this is uh, this is a very um, well this is a um, good condition for coca producers uh, because it takes it takes time it takes a lot of money uh, for the government to get into those uh, places and try to eradicate the crops so this this is how it looks in the Pacific region in Choco when and after the crops have uh, have been uh, eliminated this is in the south south center this is the what we could call uh, the door to the Amazons uh, from north to south a very sensitive area this is a also, once again Pacific region and this is uh, Putumayo and Caqueta which is in the south of the country in the limit in in well, Putumayo in the limits with uh, um, with Ecuador um, Orinoquia, um, um, well, this is east actually, uh, in the limits with Venezuela, Amazon region, uh, and uh, also some some crops that have been eradicated in Sierra Nevada, this uh, mountain range in the north of the country. Um, regarding production, um, by 2012, the country had approximately 48,000 hectares of coca crops. Uh, in 20 and 23 of the 32 uh, states that the country has, um, 3,379 hectares of those crops are located in national parks, which um, which continue doing this ecological pressure on on, on our resources. Uh, when when producers have to uh, enter to a national park, they of course have to cut the trees, uh, the species. Uh, um, go far from this uh, human presence, and then uh, the species suffer some uh, displacement, and it is it is um, well, it is it is complicating the the, the problem of of uh, coca crops in in the country. Uh, in the last in the last year, we had a net decrease. Where it is said that we're not the longer uh, the not the biggest producer uh, uh, country in the world, according to the, to the United Nations report. And as I said, uh, opium poppy, which is what we call amapola in Spanish, is less than 315 hectares. So why the, that is why it's not a, um, an important problem, or well, this is not the main problem uh, of, the, of, the, of the illegal crops in Colombia. Uh, for the uh, opium poppy production, they need a cold stage, so some of these um, crops are being um, held in other countries in the world. Um, we, um, well, transformation of the land, as I said, uh, this, the effects on natural parks and protected territories, which is directly uh, traducing some loss of diversity and biodiversity. And um, there is, there is of course, some way of uh, account for this uh, um, Negative effects on the on the uh, biodiversity in terms of economical cost, but this is a very very difficult task. And uh, just now, the country has been uh, working on, on how to put these problems in terms of money. Um, and the second part, eradication, uh, it is undertaken by the Colombian government with the support of the United States and United, in United Nations. Um, there are two main strategies for eradication. Uh, one of them is uh, taking them by hand, manual eradication, and the other is the uh, aerial uh, spraying or aerial eradication. Uh, each one of them ha have, their, uh, have their own risks. Um, for example, for manual eradication, uh, there are risks for workers because um, as the, the problem has been mutating in the last years, then now guerrillas are uh, involved in, in the production of uh, uh, coca crops, and this is this is one of the main uh, ways of being of um, financing themselves. So they are very interested in, in the um, in the crops to uh, to continue growing. So they they guard these crops and they uh, they install some some uh, landmines, and sometimes the the group of people uh, they have to be. Um, uh, protected by the police or the of, or the army in order to go to these inaccessible places and then uh, take.
take the crops by the hand. Uh, sometimes they suffer direct attacks from these uh, from these guerrillas, which are mainly FARC and uh, LN. Um, this is some examples of uh, manual eradication. That's that's actually the way it has to be done. So this is just a team uh, with some uh, protection, some basic protection, and they they take the plants, and uh, the police is is there. The police or the army is there to to uh, to protect them. Um, and the other, the other way of eradicating the uh, the crops are um, by air spraying. Uh, the main chemi chemical that is used is uh, this n N-phosphonomethylglycine, <laughs> which is best known as glyphosate. Um, it is a broad spectrum herbicide. It, it means it kills everything basically. Uh, so it, it is not, um, it doesn't distinguish between one crop or other crop, it kills everything actually. It was discovered in the uh, decade of the 60s or 70s by Monsanto and then it is being uh, actually produced by several other companies like Bayer, Dow, uh, DuPont and the same Monsanto. Um, there are some documented cases of uh, toxic effect on, of this chemical into people. Uh, there are mainly skin infection and abortion in, in some uh, communities that have been um, receiving this uh, spraying very close to, to, to their territories. Uh, some affection to, to gut flora. Uh, it, uh, the companies say that this is not toxic for humans, but it actually has some effect in the bacteria that live inside humans. So there are, there's, there's some secondary effects of the chemical in, in human communities. Um, it accumulates in soils, uh, it is not mobile, so uh, it breaks down into other compounds um, that might be even uh, more toxic than the initial um, compound. And uh, when it reaches superficial water, uh, it, it Almost does not decompose, so it can it can follow the cycle of the um, of the rivers and the lakes for a very long time. Um, something uh, that is very interesting is that these uh, crops, in order to be eliminated, uh, they require between eight and ten times <laughs> of uh, being sprayed. So this is not like a plant goes and then sprays and uh, all the plants are killed. It has to be repeated about eight and ten times. So the amount of chemical that is used is, is significant. Um, this is a map of manual eradication. Uh, it's, it's the, in the last year there, there has been an effort to undertake manual eradication. And the, the, um, this plan is working, but it, uh, it has, as I said, some complications. And uh, this is uh, the aerial eradication uh, using this glyphosate. So you will see the, um, the presence of uh, the crops and the areas that have been ha are being uh, sprayed. Um, well, there's there's a there's a very interesting case that's uh, happened with Ecuador. Um, Ecuador sued Colombia before the International Court of Justice in 2008. Due to the aerial sprains that were done uh, between 2000 and 2007, um, this this is some of the areas where Colombia has the most uh, the most intense uh, sprains uh, in the in the territory, and it is it is in the limits with Ecuador. Uh, they presented documented cases of negative effects in the skins of the uh, uh, communities living close to the, to the border. And uh, finally, last year in September 2013, uh, both countries came to an agreement. Colombia uh, um, agreed to pay 15 uh, million US dollars uh, uh, to Ecuador so that they could uh, cease and desist from, uh, des desist from the case. Uh, and this kind of creates um, um, uh, a fact or, yeah, some. Um, ref some fu future reference because uh, in some way uh, Colombia is tacitly or the government is tacitly accepting uh, that the uh, that, uh, the springs are negative but uh, in the rest of the country like in the rest of the areas that I uh, showed before 
uh, the sprains are, con are uh, constantly uh, uh, being undertaken. So it's kind of a strange. We accept to Ecuador that this is a problem, but we continue doing it in, in our same country. Uh, something I forgot to say, uh, this, um, as this is a broad spectrum uh, chemical, uh, it kills everything, not only the coca crops, but it also kills uh, other, um, other crops like banana, like coffee, like any crop that is in between, it kills it. So many farmers and especially uh, poor farmers have been uh, suffering the effects of these sprays. Um, and well, coming to some conclusions, um, there are uh, some big, huge impacts from the production, uh, some irreversible effects on some very sensitive ecosystems due to, to this ecological pressure made to, uh, to grow these coca crops. Um, manual eradication would be the best way to do it, but it, it comprises many, many risks for the police, for the army, and for the civilians that participate in this eradication. Aerial eradication uh, involves um, the risk, the risk to public health and also to ecological systems for the uh, chemical um, concentrates. Uh, and um, it, it, uh, there's, there's also difficulty to account for all of these impacts in terms of uh, economical um, yeah, and figures. Uh, but it is, this is something that the country has to do, the country is doing it, and uh, it has to be considered uh, during the this peace talks that we are having, we are currently having right now with the guerrillas, and to take a decision. So, what are we going to do? We are are we going to continue um, creating these these negative effects on the environment and the public health, or can we stop it? Uh, and how are we going to stop it? Are we going to <laughs> do it manually? Are we going to do it by spray? So, it is a, a complicated. Um, situation that involves many, many variables, uh, but mainly all of them are negative uh, effects. So, um, well, that was basically what I wanted to show you. And, uh, Hello everyone, uh, my name is Johanna Ramirez and I will present you the experiences of women in the uh, illicit drug uh, production. First of all, uh, before Lynn explained the the different experiences of women in that sector. Um, I would like to give you sh a short background uh, of how was the how work the activities of women before being displayed. Um, in the region area, in the Andean area, for example, in the Indian uh, Andean region, uh, women were more. Yeah, concentrated in activities like laborers, chair, corporate, and administrators of um, uh, small firms. And in the yeah, low, say, um, area, uh, women yeah, were working in sewing, harvesting, and selecting some slaves. And in the flat areas of Colombia, um, Women were yeah, working in in other activities in contrast to the the women in the yeah say high areas of Colombia. Um, they were working in the kitchen by cooking for um, casual work. What happened after the after being displaced? Um, some of the ways of displacement um, affect different children and the women. Um, women have yeah, the, yeah, the activities of women in the coca production have not only been uh, as victims, but also they have been part of the process as perpetrators. Um, then I will explain uh, the sector of why women have been victims. And also, women have played a role as peace builders. What are the reasons of women to be uh, part of the violent uh, situation? Um, first of all, because they have uh, very low resources and they have 
they want to yeah, escape the poverty and they need to raise the, their children. Um, additionally, they think that they have few sustainable alternatives. And if that's why they uh, become members of the, yeah, say, illegal jobs. Um, other reason is that they are victimized in their homes. And they la would like to say independence of their families. And that is one reason to escape. And additionally, uh, because there are a lot of uh, education. What are the activities as being a member of uh, revolutionary groups and self-defense groups, for example? Um, they work in the kitchen by transforming uh, coca leaves into a coca paste. And also they cook for Again, at the um, at the for um, as uh, <coughs> cooking for casual workers. Um, additionally, they collect the flesh and also select them, the leaves. Sorry, um, they select, uh, select the leaves uh, of coca, and they transport part of. So they ha have been the way to transport. Uh, the products from one village to other village. Um, it is very easy for women to hide the information because in case at, uh, when the police uh, is there around, um, yeah, it's easier to, so they are, they look like innocent that they don't have sort of products. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, um, yeah, so actually this is also being part of these um, illegal groups um, and also they are, complain, oh, they are part uh, of the um, yeah, political discussions and they unfortunately um, are part of the force and displacement. Um, on the other hand, uh, why women have been victims of the um, of this coca production? Um, um, yeah, um, women have been raped. That is one of the big uh, problems of the coca production, and it is also a war strategy. So. It was a bit strange to, to see why, why it's a, a strategy for war, but it is like a way to, like a weapon war, like, yeah, to fight against the, the enemy. Um, additionally, um, when women have been victims of the coca production, they lost uh, the resources and um, they have also to move from one say rural from the rural sector to urban sector to find um, a new life this uh, hands to a psychological trauma and and also they lose their identity um, additionally, they are very high trained. Um, these reasons to so the reason that they became uh, become peace builders uh, is because of the hard experience, uh, the strong experience before as victims. Um, as Cesar discussed or mentioned before. Um, because of the fumigation or because the U.S. sponsored uh, this fumigation or the coca cultic um, crops. Uh, many families and children have been affected by, by the fumigation and they lost also uh, crops, livestock. Um, there, is a, uh, there is very a huge issue 
health issue and yeah they they have to find a solution and that's why women have organized uh, some communities and they fight against communication and also drug trafficking um, yeah they also create some national international network with bolivia and peru uh, they organize a very uh, uh, the bigger march in Colombia that was in 1996. Uh, that was um, organized by women. I will explain uh, later on. And also, they used some non-violent strategy to to put the military forces. Uh, away uh, or to yeah to to avoid this uh, war into the the communities. Um, this uh, situation as victims and the reason to be peace builders um, push them to say or to fight uh, loudly why it is important to to yeah to uh, yeah to fight against that uh, coca production and this is one reason um, so i picked up four examples there are uh, more uh, for example omaira morales she is a representative uh, the representative of andean council of coca list um her life as member of a social so, uh, civil society has been very difficult. Um, she lives in a coca growing area. Um, she also worked in the coca production before. And now um, she is threatened by guerrillas groups and also paramilitary groups. But even though she, um, yeah, she uh, protests against um, yeah, the uh, aerial spraying, and also she supports uh, her community by growing coca and also um, by producing um, like tea or soaps or something like that like other alternative of coca but not the the illegal way. Um, Doris Pushana, it is um uh, she's a, a war tribal leader, the Jones one. Uh Luis Rodriguez, can uh, Juan tribal leader, and Lord Ilva Trashes, is the leader of the three hundred years old of NASA tribal. Um they, they are all um yeah fighting against coca cultivation and they the um yeah Lutis Rodriguez especially is against coca production so she will say please don't cultivate more coca and they are fine so they're trying to to yeah, to say the government, please, uh, our rights are more important than that, that fine against, uh, say, um, illegal uh, groups. So, uh, women's roles during the illegal coca productions uh, differs depending on the individual background. Um, yeah, the victimization uh, of women have been used uh, as a strategy. Um, Colombian women um, have been victimized in the process, and they are likely, like these women, to defend their rights. Um, yeah, in, as, you, as I showed you before, uh, the, in conflict situations, women are more vulnerable, and they have also a great strength uh, and ingenuity to cope. So, 
Yeah, uh, and I would like to show you uh, some pictures. The one is the, big, the biggest march in 1996. Uh, the next one is um, in the cocoa cultivation. The next one is uh, by milking. And before being displaced, the, like that will be the role of women. Um, in the um, left side is Ilva Fjord, I mentioned before. She works in the hand crafts. Um, here we can see a woman in the uh, being part of the Dorija. Um, and also here, for example, we can see um, women that have been displaced and they are looking for a place in, in this big city. Um, yeah, so we should be as well. Yeah, I, I, I think it's okay. Well, yeah, that's uh, my presentation. I have to present the... Uh uh, economic impact of illicit drug production in Colombia. So, um, to begin, um, Colombia has been regarded as one of the most uh, success stories in terms of economic growth uh, and stability in Latin America. Uh, we can see that from 1930 to, 1970, to the 1970s, uh, good macroeconomic performance has been characterized by uh, increasing GDP growth rates combined with a reduction in, in, in volatility. So, uh, according to many economists, um, this situation was due to uh, able technocrats and also sound, sound institutions as a key driving element of this success story. So, um, first of all, once we look at the uh, GDP per capita growth in Colombia since the 1960s. So, we can see that in the 1960s, the uh, Colombian economy, uh, you know, uh, reflected a GDP per capita growth that was positive. It was not quite quite high as compared to other economies in the region. However, it was stable at 2.07 on average across the decade. So once we move into the 1970s, uh, on average, the uh, Colombian economy in terms of GDP per capita growth quite increased as a consequence of the uh, coffee boom that took effect during this decade. So as we can see the significant peak here in the 19, uh, 1970s, we can see that uh, uh, is probably one of the best uh, decades in terms of uh, economic performance for, for, for Colombia. However, once we move into the 1980s, uh, some of you might heard of the uh, Latin American lost decade, which basically was a decade where most of the, some of the Latin American uh, countries uh, incurred a significant amount of debt, and some of them actually you know, uh, were not able to repay these debts, and they basically just uh, defaulted. So uh, we can see that on average, the whole Latin American region reported zero growth during the 1980s. However, the uh, Colombian economy, uh, even though it quite, quite a collapse after the 1970s, um, it reported positive growth. However, we, we can see that it was a significant collapse uh, during the 1980s. So um, many of the economists at the time, basically just uh, one of the strategies for them was to call for the international, international organizations for, for help. So we call, we, call, we call the World Bank, we call the IMF for some uh, structural adjustment programs in order to uh, make the economy to come back uh, as, you know, as we move forward in, into, the, into the next decade. So the expectation uh, in the 19, at the end of the 1980s was that they, you know, as, after all these packages were going to take effect, uh, the economy was going to come back strong. However, most of the Latin American regions who adopted these packages actually came back very strong. And we can see that the Latin American region on average actually came back very, very strong. However, Colombia actually decelerated to 0.99% in terms of GDP per capita growth. So what I'm going to try to find out, what I'm going to try to show you in the next slides, is what has happened to this, uh, why did Colombia decelerate even further during the 1990s if it adopted a package of reforms with, base, with explicit goals of accelerating economic growth as, as we move forward. Uh, and then as, we, as you might have heard you know, throughout the different presentations, the Colombian economy after the 1990s actually came back strong. So basically, basically what I'm going to try to explain in the next few slides is why the Colombian economy decelerated uh, in the 1990s. The expectation was very high after all these uh, you know, structural packages took effect and why it actually came back strong as we entered the new, uh, the last decade, as we entered the, uh, the year 2000. So um, many economists have basically uh, argued uh, 
try to explain this, this, this phenomenon in Colombia uh, in the 1990s and then in, in the year 2000. Uh, some traditional views, for example, argue that poor growth performance in Colombia was due to external shocks, uh, poor fiscal management, and lack of additional reforms necessary for the uh, structural reform packages to deliver better results. So basically, just said, well, there were some other things that had to take effect once, the, uh, once these packages took effect in order for the economy to come back. However, uh, some more economists argue that you know, it, it, you know, some more things actually happened in the country that were more, more, uh, more influential in terms of the performance of the economy during the 1990s. And some of these economists, for example, argue that the fortune generated by drug trafficking, which exacerbated crime and violence, explained the change in economic performance in Colombia since the 1980s. So basically, these guys are saying that uh, the reason the, Col the Colombian economy decelerated in the 1990s was because of the significant amount of drug trafficking that was taking place. So once we look into the deep uh, sources that actually made the Colombian economy to decelerate in the 1990s, and once we decompose into the, the main three components, uh, for example, once we look at the, uh, the changes in capital output ratio, uh, changes in uh, uh, human capital per capita, and also changes in productivity, we can see, in order to find out what actually contributed to the deceleration of the economy in the 1990s. So once we look at the capital output ratio, we can see, for example, that uh, capital uh, output ratio actually increased uh, as a consequence of trade liberalization, capital inflows, and currency appreciation in the 1990s. So we can see here how it went from 0.38% to 1%. So capital output ratio didn't have nothing to do with the uh, deceleration of the economy in the 1990s. Once we look at human capital per capita, we can see that since the 1970s, it has actually remained steady. Uh, this basically just reflects stable progress in educational attainment in the country. So human capital per capita has nothing to do with the des deceleration of the economy in the 1990s. However, once we look at the productivity, changes in productivity, we can see since, since the 1980s, the uh, productivity, changes in productivity have actually collapsed. So you might, you might ask, well, what, has, what has actually happened to productivity? Because productivity was the biggest component that has made the Colombian economy decelerate in the 1990s. So now I'm going to show you what has happened to um, the uh, collapse of productivity. So basically, uh, the certain expansion in the production of illicit crops, as, we, as you heard throughout these different presentations, led to the increase in crime and worsen security conditions, which subsequently reduced productivity. So basically, on this graph here, for example, you can see on this red uh, line here, you can see that after 1980s, the area under coca, coca cultivation starts to increase significantly, and it peaks in the, in the year 2000, the year where the, uh, Colombia has become one of the largest producers of cocaine in the world. So one thing that is very interesting is that uh, the, uh, the uh, area under coca, culti coca cultivation is, is, is also related to the, uh, to the amount of homicides rates that were committed in the country during the 90, uh, you know, especially at the beginning of the uh, 1990s. So you can see that um, area under coca cultivation and the homicide rate actually uh, are very, very correlated. And that's, that, that has actually what has made the uh, productivity uh, collapse. Why? Because two different mechanisms. First one, because as more people you know, disengage from the, uh, from the, pro from the, from, from the uh, productive sectors of the economy and they move into crime-related activities, basically they just produce zero output. So the economy, just basically they just not contribute anything to, 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 the, uh, to growth. And second, also the uh, physical capital was diverted to unproductive activities such as defense equipment, bombs, and all these things that uh, were carried out through uh, this whole uh, you know, uh, conflict that was taking place in the country. So year 2000 was a very particular year for Colombia because it became, Colombia became the largest producers of coca in the world and also became one of the most violent countries in the world. So consequently, that had a significant impact in, in the collapse of productivity. So, well, you might, you might see, say, well, we already, talk, we already talked about the, um, you know, changes in capital output ratio human capital per capita and also productivity. What about some other different variables that might have taken, taken effect at the time? For example, if we look at uh, external conditions, such as, for example, uh, terms of trade shocks, or if we look at, for example, the stabilization policies, such as lack of price stability, or uh, cyclical volatility, or, for example, real exchange rate overvaluation, or systemic banking crisis, uh, or you know, the structural policies uh, institutions that uh, I mentioned before. Uh, what, what would have been the impact if we measured these variables with crime? What would be the impact of crime 
uh, on the on, in terms of GDP per capita. So once we have this panel data uh, regression, we can see uh, we can see the actually the, the significance of, of, of crime in terms of uh, uh, reducing the uh, GDP per capita growth. So once you you know once you increase criminality by one percent, you would expect GDP per capita growth to decrease by zero point three percent, and this is significant at the five percent level. So one of the reasons productivity decelerated in the 1990s was because of the significant amount of uh, area under, under with, with coca cultivation that was taking place, which, based, which automatically was, was correlated to the uh, number of homicides that were, that were being committed at the time. And also that automatically made uh, uh, productivity to decrease and automatically made the GDP per capita growth to decrease. So that's the reason what happened in the 1990s. Basically, uh, is the correlation between uh, area under, areas under coca cultivation and uh, the homicide rate. So now uh, I'm going to try to explain what has happened uh, after the year 2000. We, we saw in the first graph that actually the Colombian economy came back uh, after it has been decelerated in the, year, in the 1990s. So one of the, strategies, uh, one, of the, one of the strategies of the Colombian government at the time when uh, you know, the, 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 the situation in the country in the year 2000 was really, really, really depressing. Uh, Colombia became, as I mentioned, the largest producer of coca in the world. It also uh, it had also become the, the, one of the most violent countries in the world. So at the time, the government just basically sat down and said, well, the status quo doesn't really work. Something has to happen. Something needs to be done because, uh, they, I mean, this is putting a, a significant toll on, uh, you know, on society at large. So something had to be done. So basically, the, uh, the government, the, the president at the time, Andres Pastrana, uh, went to the uh, United States government and said, well, you, you became the largest consumer of drugs in the world. Uh, we're becoming one of the most uh, a, a, a producers of cocaine in our country. We were putting all this significant amount of dead bodies uh, as a consequence of this war on drugs. Something must have happened. So they basically came up with a plan. And basically, the plan was Plan Colombia, the, most fam the famous Plan Colombia, which basically was a military alliance between the United States and Colombia in the war against illegal drug production. Uh, trafficking and the organized crime groups associated with these activities. So basically you can see here on the chart that uh, Plan Colombia was um, desegregated into different components. 27% uh, of the funds were uh, allocated to strengthening democratic institutions and then 56% uh, were allocated to fight against illegal drugs and organized crime. So basically strengthening the Colombian, the Colombian military uh, against all these uh, drug product producers and also 16% were economic and social revitalization. For all the funds that were gathered for Plan Colombia, 65% uh, were provided contribute by the Colombian government, and also 35% uh, were contributed by the uh, United States government. So now I'm going to show you the results of Plan Colombia. Uh, we can see, as I showed you before, the year 2000 was, in, as I mentioned, was a key year for Colombia because. Uh, as we can see here, the area under coca cultivation was just huge. 163,000 hectares uh, had coca at the time. So Plan Colombia basically was very effective at reducing the amount of coca, uh, of area under coca cultivation. And we can see that by 2011, after all this decade of Plan Colombia and all this huge war that the country uh, undertake, we can see that by year 2011, uh, 63,000 uh, hectares. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, 63,000 of uh, hectares still had cocaine. So it was a significant decrease. However, uh, you can see here that it's not enough. I mean, the, the efforts were quite significant, but still 63,000 is a lot. Uh, also, the, uh, in terms of homicide rate, as I, as I mentioned to you before, violence was exa exacerbated at the time. So you can see, as I mentioned also, also to you, uh, you know, air and the coca cultivation is correlated with homicide rate. So once we decrease the amount of, ho of uh, air and the coca cultivation, the homicide rate starts to decrease. So we can see here that uh, we had, we had a, a homicide rate of 65 per 100,000 of the population in 2000. <laughs> and then it significantly um, decreased by half to about 33 per 100,000 of the population. So Plan Colombia was completely effective at reducing the amount of homicides and area of the coca cultivation. So also one significant uh, benefit of Plan Colombia of this huge strengthening of, of the Colombian military was that uh, at the time uh, kidnapping was taking a huge toll in Colombian society. 
You might heard of some terrible stories like Ingrid Betancourt, some of the Americans who were kidnapped, some police officers, soldiers, po uh, politicians, journalists, uh, many people who just basically disappeared from, from, from society in just one second. And they were kidnapped by, by months, by years, some of them actually stayed by, by a decade uh, under, under, under these uh, rebel groups. So basically, Plan Colombia uh, was very effective at reducing this huge cost train that was, that was, that was, that was taken on the Colombian on the Colombian, Colombian society, uh, was very effective at reducing the kidnapping rate. So we can see here that by year 2000, the year, the, the famous year of Colombia, uh, 3,700 kidnappings per 100,000 of the population, we were reduced to about 305 by year 2011. So quite a significant improvement by Plan Colombia in terms of the, uh, of the kidnapping rate. So we can see here, uh, the, this, this graph just helped to explain the second part of the graph that I show you on the the, on the, on, the, on the, the one of the first uh, slides that I had, the reason the Colombian economy came back very strong after year 2000 was because Plan Colombia was able to reduce the uh, air and the coca cultivation. That automatically reduced the homicide rate, which automatically just basically shift a significant large, large number of the population into more productive activities, and then productivity increased, and then the GDP growth, GDP per capita, it starts to increase again. So we can see that by, uh, on average, the uh, Colombian economy reported an average of 2.5 as a, you know, in terms of GDP per capita growth, which is quite positive compared to, uh, you know, the huge deceleration in the 1990s. So one of the, one of the things that is very interesting to note is that, you know, Plan Colombia was a war. It's, it was a lot of things that happened actually behind these different things, and that's beyond the scope of this presentation. But however, it was, as we can see here, it was very effective at reducing this, thing, this significant constraints in the economy, and also consequently, it sent a signal to uh, the uh, recovery of the uh, GDP per capita growth. So now, uh, just to conclude, um, Deceleration of growth is there, as I, as I mentioned to you before, uh, deceleration of growth is the result of the collapse of productivity. Uh, it implies that both physical and human capital uh, accumulation were not the cause of the reduction in growth. So the collapse of productivity is directly related to the increase in criminality. Uh, Colombia's growth deceleration during the 1990s relative to the 1980s uh, can be explained by its high homicide rate, as I mentioned to you. And after year 2000, uh, the large reduction in cocaine cultivation and criminality uh, have contributed to boost productivity and consequently fortified the Colombian economy in the last decade. So between 2005 and 2010, uh, Colombia reached a growth rate of 3.0% on average. Uh, so as I mentioned, quite positive compared to the huge deceleration that was experienced in the 1990s. So to wrap things up, I want to leave you with this graph uh, and this question for all of you to reflect on this topic. So is the war on drugs self-defeating? Let me show you some, some statistics. The most recent statistics gathered by the uh, United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime and also the uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy at the White House. So we can see, as I already showed you in the previous graphs, that the uh, hectares, hectares with cocaine in Colombia were co quite decreased from 163,000 here to 63,000 in 2011 after this huge military intervention took effect. So you would expect that once you constrain the supply side, the prices on the, on the, uh, on the demand side will quite increase as a, as a result of this huge constraint on the supply side. So according to this most recent data, we can see that one pri the price of one kilogram of cocaine in the United States is evaluated, was evaluated at $37,900 once uh, Plan Colombia kicks off. However, in 2011, we expect that the price would significantly increase after this huge reduction in the number of hectares uh, with cocaine in Colombia. However, we can see the price that actually has decreased. So 35,862, one kilogram of cocaine in the United States evaluated right now, uh, according to this most recent data, to 35,862. So you might say, well, what actually happened? What's going on? I mean, the Colombian government put this huge amount of effort to eradicate uh, these areas on the coca cultivation and to constrain the supply side. And the United States, the price in the United States actually stayed the same. So the reason is, according to this most recent data, Supply of cocaine in the United States was evaluated at 398,000 kilograms once Plan Colombia kicks off. By year 2011, the supply has actually increased to 484,830 kilograms. So you say, well, I mean, the, this huge military intervention to, uh, you know, cut down supply, to reduce this, you know, this, this, this huge, this huge uh, amount of uh, areas of the coca cultivation, you know, 
to 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 reduce the the the, uh, the supply that was being available in the in the in the United States in the, in the U.S. market. What has actually happened? So the reason is the reason is that um, actually there are two two main components to this story. First, uh, productivity per hectare in Colombia has actually quite increased because as people are being constrained with the land, as you know, all this whole military intervention is taking place. People are just trying to fight, trying to become more resourceful and try to become, trying to make, try to come up with some more strategies in order to continue producing to fulfill this huge demand. So they are just becoming more productive. And here we can we can see that productivity has increased from 4.3 kilograms per hectare to about eight. Eight kilograms per hectare. So people are becoming more resourceful in the limited amount of land that they have. And also one thing that is very curious is that these drug producers, since they're being constrained in, in Colombia by, by this huge military intervention, they just move into other areas, to other neighboring countries. And so we can see here the hectares with cocaine in Bolivia. Once Plan Colombia kicks off, uh, it was you know 14,000. Now in 2011, it's 30,000. So it has quite, it has doubled. And then hectares with cocaine in Peru were 43,000. By year 2011, it was 61. So people, two components to this huge, significant increase in the supply of cocaine in the United States. First, people are becoming more productive. Second, they're just, be, they're just moving around. They're just simply moving around where they can just continue uh, you know, fulfilling this demand. So in order to answer this question, is the war on drugs self-defeating? Well, once, I mean, if you only tackle the supply side without doing anything on the demand side, as, as it's been happening right now, you know, we're, we're putting this huge effort on the demand side and we're strengthening the militaries and we're trying to, you know, cut down production, in this, you know, trying to constrain the supply side, but nothing has happened in the domestic, in the, in the, in the demand side. So basically, uh, you know, the results have proven here that this, this, this war on drugs is just basically self-defeating. Uh, if we don't, if we don't tackle both sides at the same time, basically we're just wasting time. So thank you all very much. He's telling us the story that Black Colombia works and therefore we have less homicides and less kidnappings. Well, it turns out that during that time, actually, uh, what happened was that paramilitars displaced guerrillas from the trade of drugs. And around that time, it was when President Uribe took place in the office. So somehow he started supporting paramilitary groups that in turn control a coca crops and therefore the confrontations decrease and therefore violence decrease. So I'm not completely sure that all the story has to do with how successful the war on drugs was. Uh, and what I will see here is that the figures are a little bit uh, less positive. So we will see that actually the uh, elasticity of supply uh, of coca is not as uh, high as this graph would show. Um, so uh, in this presentation, I just want to make a three or four points. The first point I want to make is that a uh, so far, we are talking about Colombia, but what I want to say is that coca, drugs, and cocaine is not a problem that is only affecting Colombia. That this is a problem that has a global scale, that is a problem that is uh, touching many other countries, and that therefore is a problem that we all should take uh, attention. So what we see here in this graph is that most of the cultivation is taking place in Andean countries, 70% of the coca that is reaching U.S. markets is coming from Colombia alone, and the main destination countries are U.S. and Europe, but you see that on the way, it actually touches many other countries. It affects Caribbean countries, it affects Central American countries, it affects Africa, it affects South Africa. What is the toll that you let out of this is that First of all, homicides rate are all increasing, not only in Colombia, but also in all the countries where coca is trafficked. So you see here, the countries in Central America are the ones who uh, score highest in terms of homicide rates. Uh, 55 uh, over, over 100,000 inhabitants in Salvador, Jamaica, Guatemala, Venezuela, all these are the countries where the trafficking routes are going. Uh, besides uh, coca and cocaine trafficking is leaving many other countries and many other problems that are very similar as the ones that have been uh, explored in Colombia and which I will show in more detail here. And finally, uh, it's not completely true that the consumption of drugs is only affecting the North uh, countries, the Western countries. As you see here in this graph, you see that there are many more dark areas in the map. So uh, now actually, 
uh, two countries in South America rank as the, mo as the countries with highest consumption rate. Chile and uh, Uruguay, but also Argentina, Brazil have a high consumption rate. So one of the consequences of trafficking is that on the way people get used to the substance and start consuming, and that of course could have health consequences. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to say that maybe if your country has not been shown yet in any of these uh, graphs, you would like to see where the opium trafficking routes are going, or actually where the amphetamine routes go. Uh, so uh, all countries are involved in the problem of drugs. This is not a problem only for Colombia, for Mexico. This is a problem that concerns all us. Uh, we have already seen a little bit on the production of coca uh, about uh, what, something that we have not seen so far is that Colombia became the largest producer only in 2000. And what is very uh, paradoxical is that actually Colombia in 94, when we were talking about the cartels, when we were talking about Pablo Escobar, was actually not the major produ producer of cocaine. It was producing only 20% of all uh, hectares were planted in Colombia. It was actually after the cartels were dismantled that the production of cocaine started to grow. And this coincided with successful eradication in Peru, again, the story in reverse, uh, and uh, thereafter it has been uh, decreasing, partly as a result of successful eradication, uh, but also uh, partly due to a change in the, in the commercialization structure. This decrease in areas, what they don't show is that actually uh, because of increased productivity, the total production of coca was not decreasing so dramatically. Um, so even though coca is important, uh, uh, Colombia is an important producer of coca in the world, coca is not the main produce pro product in Colombia. Here you see the agricultural production in Colombia, and you see that coca has 3% of the agricultural product compared to cattle that has 45%, coffee that has around 10%, and fruits that have around 50%. So it's also not fair that you stigmatize Colombians as only producing drugs and living out of drugs. Um, and uh, second, in terms of how important is coca in terms of uh, economic uh, or, or the volume on the economy, you will see that uh, actually Colombia controls very little of the or the share in the PIB in the in the gross domestic product is relatively low, basically because the big gain on uh, commercialization is actually happening in the U.S. markets. Uh, the Total trade of coke of, of uh, illicit drugs was 30 billion US dollars, and out of that, 70% was remaining in the US in the distribution. 50% uh, was uh, on the wholesale level, and for Andean countries, you see that the proportion that they receive is around 1.5 to 1% on trafficking. So, uh, as a result, uh, the, pro the the participation of coca in the GDP is relatively low. It's estimated, this is an estimated of 2003, recent estimated of years go up to 2006, uh, say that it is no more than 2% of the GDP. Uh, here, what you see, however, is that in the 80s and in the 90s, where we were having the cartels, the participation was much higher. And this is, of course, clear when you think that they were also uh, participating actively in the U.S. markets, and therefore the, the uh, money that could come back to Colombia was larger. Um, and uh, then uh, the question is, who is getting uh, the money uh, from coca trafficking? And you see that the producers, that is the farmers living in coca growing areas, are receiving only 14% at the most of all the income that is uh, being generated from coca. A large amount of that is uh, staying in trafficking. Um, so uh, if you look uh, on the other hand, that would be what is Colombia earning from coca. The other side would be how much is it costing to Colombia. Uh, you see that Colombian government is investing up to 1% of the GDP in the war on drugs. Uh, most of it is invested in control of supply policies uh, and a control of demand is actually uh, just a fraction of it. Um, 
this is only if you are accounting by the by the investment that the government actually does. But of course, the cost of drugs is much larger than that if you account for in the, the indirect effects, the health uh, consequences of the consumption of drugs, uh, what is the problem of uh, productivity losses due to uh, getting sick, and uh, what is the problem of the use of factors that are being wasted. And the most recent study is from 2000. We need to update that. And it actually shows that in that moment it was up to 1.8% of the GDP. The Colombia government invests 1.25% of the budget annually on the war on drugs. This is about the same that the government is investing in the university system. And surprisingly, there is almost nothing on research on what is the impact that this policy has had. Uh, and again, this would be just an uh, underestimation because here we would not account for the indirect effects that coca has in terms of violence. First of all, coca is helping to finance paramilitar groups, A, because uh, uh, drug dealers uh, pay their own paramilitar groups. They started as a result of uh, uh, cartels who wanted to finance self-defense groups against guerrillas, and second, because it also helps to finance guerrillas uh, who are deriving some of their income from uh, even taxing, uh, ta uh, uh, yeah, uh, making uh, taxes on the production of coca or uh, actually trafficking it themselves. Uh, the consequence of this is that it generates homicides, delin delinquency, and it uh, turns out into human displacement. Uh, second, uh, coca uh, and cocaine is generating inequality. One of the consequences of these cartels in Colombia was that the land concentration increased. And as a result, many farmers were left landless. That, of course, again, helps to contribute to this human displacement and aggravates this problem of uh, internal conflict. Uh, corruption, deforestation and pollution, increased consumption, lower investments in education. So in turn, there are many other indirect effects of uh, drugs. Um, yeah, we have seen already many uh, figures on how a uh, crime has uh, evolved. And what you see is that actually it was during the cartel's time and when coca cultivation was higher that the homicide rates were low, uh, highest. But also you see that a, a, a human displacement is very high. What is the response of the uh, Colombian government? A uh, Colombian government has engaged into the war on drugs that is a compound of two main components, demand and supply control, in demand, <coughs> prevention and education, treatment. And in the supply control, it aims at attacking all the different steps from cultivation, processing, transport, and money laundering. Um, the results of these policies have been rather disappointed. First, when you compare the prices of drugs, you see that uh, actually the cost, uh, the price of coca here has been uh, decreasing over the decade. This comparison alone is a little bit unfair because, as we know, the final price depends on demand and supply side, and also the demand has been falling. So partly it's clear that the price would also decrease. But uh, also, uh, the decrease in coca cultivation in Colombia has been followed by increase in other countries. And what farmers have done is that they have adapted their production techniques to cope with eradication. So they have, A, increased productivity, and second, they have generated innovation in terms of different techniques to protect their plants. Uh, there are indirect effects in Colombia. So in this graph, you see that in 2000, the coca cultivation was concentrated in few areas. There was in the south of the country, a, a little bit in the east, and in this part in the north. In 2005, after eradication, actually this spread over all country. And now you see now many more areas. And still in 2011, the production was dispersed, affecting larger uh, part of the country. Um, 
The other uh, failure of the policy has to do with uh, the elasticity of supply. In one study that we did uh, using a, a choice experiment, we asked uh, farmers how would they react to different uh, levels of eradication. We see that actually 1% increase in eradication could decrease areas in only 0.66%. And uh, this would be uh, very costly. In another uh, study that we did in 2003, we actually show that uh, the actual level of a return of coca to uh, alternative crops and the actual risk could imply that uh, still uh, efforts to control, to control a coca using eradication are more effective than the controls using alternative <laughs> development. But in order to increase the effectiveness of the policy, more emphasis should be put in eradication. This is a little bit technical, so I'm not going into it very deep. Um, okay, and then uh, just basically what we have seen is that uh, policies that are uh, affecting uh, only supply are not as effective as policies that look at trafficking. As you see, the price of a uh, production is very small, so whatever, uh, and as successful as you are decreasing supply, the increase in price that you will get will be insignificant in the final uh, price in the, co in the destination countries. So this is a study by uh, Daniel Mejia and Pascual Restrepo, and what they show is that if uh, the government wanted to reduce coca supply in one kilo, Controls like the Plan Colombia would cost 163,000, whereas controlling trafficking would be much cheaper. Uh, the elasticity of supply to trafficking is much larger than the elasticity of supply to, uh, to control, to eradication, and uh, fighting a uh, drug in producing countries. And uh, some, a figure that is impressive is that they estimate that if they increase the military expenses in Colombia in three times the amount that they have been spending to today, that is a, from 1% to the GDP, imagine to 3% of the GDP, coca supply will be decreased only in 20%. So how effective could this be to affect the final uh, consumer countries? And uh, also, when you look at the uh, response of different policies or the relative cost of the policies comparing treatment versus control of supply, this is a study that is very old, but here you see that the uh, cost of reducing consumption by 1% is much higher if they use policies that focus on producer countries compared to policies that tackle treatment and control. So here we go. Um, except that the government is using 60% of the resources to control supply and only 40% of the resources into treatment and prevention. So what about legalization? Yes, the political discussion is going there, uh, yet it's not clear whether this is a, actually a good a scenario for hard drugs. No country is willing to talk about that, no government is willing to take the, the decision to do it. And uh, the discussion is always favoring the point of view of the freedom of the, consum of the consumer who uh, can decide what he wants to buy, but is hardly ever referring to the producer who is just responding to the demand. Um, and uh, basically, uh, it's not clear whether uh, this policy would uh, be implemented or not. So what can we do then? Uh, there are... Uh, many things that have to be done, and one of them is to do more research. Here, uh, there are still many things that we don't know and that uh, we need to know better in order to design better policies. Uh, so one of these questions is why is it that people is cultivating coca? What are the drivers at the individual, at the country level of cultivating coca? And what are the impacts of anti-drug policies? Are they working or not? What are the intended and unintended costs consequences of anti-drug policies, and uh, what about alternative policies? Is it possible to use 
uh, different ways of uh, uh, decreasing coca? Is it possible to generate more sustainable policies, change of attitudes towards illegality? Is it possible to generate uh, different views about it? And another topic that has not been uh, studied and where you don't see many studies is what is happening as consequences of trafficking in all these trafficking routes. How are the countries suffering as consequence of a drug trafficking. So uh, the message uh, to take up here is that uh, the problem of drugs is a global problem that is affecting you as much as us, that this is the number pro the problem number one in Colombia, and that uh, we need more emphasis in demand side policies, not all the emphasis should be in the supply, and that the discussion of legalization should be more inclusive to reflect a, a complete view of demand and supply sides. Thank you.